It's Friday night in Midtown Manhattan, and I'm here to hang out with Martin Shkreli, who became famous in October for raising the price of a drug that's used to treat HIV-positive patients by more than 5,000%. The drug in question is called Daraprint. It used to cost $13.50 per pill. Turing changed the cost to a whopping $750. That's price gouging, pure and simple. Martin Shkreli is a 32-year-old entrepreneur and company builder from Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. After increasing the price of Daraprim overnight, he became the poster child for capitalistic greed. Shkreli ran with the bad boy image, flaunting his trollish behavior in the media. He's not your typical pharma tycoon anyway. Over the past year, he's funded an indie record label, claimed he would bail Bobby Shmurda out of jail, and purchased the only copy of a legendary Wu-Tang Clan album, with no immediate plans to play it. In December, Shkreli was indicted on securities fraud charges and is now under investigation by both Congress and the Federal Trade Commission for price gouging. So his time in the spotlight isn't over yet. I caught up with him at his Midtown apartment to meet the man behind the headlines. Oh yeah, I noticed uh, we are right next to Pfizer. Is this, <laughs> on, is this on purpose? It's a little on purpose, so I walk by here every morning I go to work and I walk by Pfizer's world, quote unquote, world headquarters and they don't have one lab in there. They don't have, you know, any research going on. This company's cut billions of dollars of research and they raise price all the time. In fact, they raised price on 100 drugs just last week and nobody wrote anything about it. But so it's fun to kind of walk by here and simultaneously see like what I love and what I hate. Um, I love drugs and how they can help people, but I also hate companies that are kind of hypocritical and full of shit. And Pfizer's a good example of, of a company like that. So that, are you not cold, by the way? It's like you're wearing like a, a rain jacket. Yeah, it's whatever. Cold out. It's all right. Oh, impervious? Not impervious. <laughs> You're getting uh, heckled right now. No, he said free Screlly, so that's great. Oh, if it's freeze, like, I'm gonna hit you. Sorry, never mind. No, oh, it's all love. So, yeah, this is this is yours? Your... What? No. <laughs> it's probably FBI. So. Yeah, there you go. Um, so <laughs> this is. FBI is messing with my business. This is the spot. Checking to see if it's FBI. I don't, it might be FBI. This is the spot. This is it, right? Oh, uh, that's the album, yeah. Okay. All right, let's open a really nice bottle. This is a 2005 Petrus Magnum. Okay. So we're gonna have some of this, maybe play some chess or do whatever you want. It's been a while since I've done this. I'm assuming you go first, right? I do. <laughs> cool, I know that much, but. Beyond that, it might be a little bad. So I so, hit this every time? I yeah. Okay. So you play the Sicilian defense frequently, or? No, I don't know what that even means. Okay. So I don't understand what wine we're drinking, and I don't understand the game that we're playing, so <laughs> it's fine. The Sicilian defense is one of the more popular um, moves in chess. Um, but uh, it doesn't appear you know how to play chess very well. No. Anyway, what do we want to talk about? I kind of want to know how you got started in you know, the hedge fund business. Um, I got interested in stocks as a kid, and my friends made fun of me <laughs> all the time uh, for that. You know, in fact, I remember the kids that made fun of me for caring about stock, uh, the stock market. And I, um, um, I told them that I'd, uh, you know, uh, that it would someday would matter. And um, you know, I, I got more and more interested in investments and. Uh, the time came for me to, to get like a part-time job slash internship, and I, I uh, found my way into a hedge fund. But over time, I kind of realized that that um, who gives a shit? You know, at the end of the day, like, is that really a career? You know, predicting the stock price. You might as well gamble on racehorses or blackjack or poker. I mean, it's it's such a silly. I'm threatening your queen, so just keep that in mind. It's sort of oh, a silly. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of a silly. Um, queen's the most important piece. Cool. I'll, um, I'll move her. Yes. So um, in any event, I kind of went from you know, this, this kind of ridiculous idea that people should sit around and speculate on a stock price like it's something to do. I mean, it's absurd. Um, and, and start a drug company. One, I could do it, most importantly, that I understood medicine and science enough to the point where I could start a drug company. 
too is very profitable. A lot of people think that you are evil. I know you know that. Yeah. Are you evil? Am I evil? No, no. I, um, I, uh, I think I'm the opposite of evil, right? I mean, I, I think that um, almost it became a thing where I wanted to agree to do it, like uh, participate in it and say, oh yeah, I am evil. You know, let me, let me be the bad guy. And I started doing funny and fun stuff that, that maybe even extended that concept of, yeah, sure, I'll, I'm evil. Um, I'll be the Bond villain. And, uh, but the reality is, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to someone that cares deeply about helping people's lives. So I think the idea that I represent pharma is insane. Uh, that I don't. Um, I mean, I, I don't like most drug companies. I think most of them do a bad job. I think that um, I'm different. Yeah, I'm a capitalist. I'd love to make a, uh, an even bigger fortune than I've got now, but I'm not going to do it at the expense of, of a human life. You know, we sell our drugs for a dollar to the government, but we sell our drugs for seven fifty a pill to Walmart, to ExxonMobil, to all these big companies, and they pay full price because fuck them. Why shouldn't they? And if I take that money and I'm, I'm using it to do research for dying kids, I think I'm a hero, let alone evil. So how did you decide that you wanted to purchase Daraprim as opposed to any other drug that treats a rare illness? Well, my team you know, um, looks for drugs uh, to buy. And I've been fascinated by infections. Um, for a long time, my sister was dying of an infection. Um, and uh, we didn't know it was an infection. It was this. Um, um, just this strange symptomatology where she couldn't move. And it was really scary. And um, so I've always been sort of fascinated by infections because they're alive. They're alive within you. And it's, it's amazing because we need drugs to kill these, these bugs. And um, for Daraprim, um, the uh, opportunity presented itself where we could um, you know, um, buy this medicine. This medicine could have been for sale. So we approached. Um, this company and we ended up buying it. So we saw that as an opportunity um, to make money for our shareholders, um, but also then build a platform of a company that was focused on rare infections. We knew ahead of time that we were gonna raise the price. You know, we paid so much for that medicine relative to the amount of money it was making that we, we knew that we had to raise the price. It wasn't gonna be, and the company selling it to us knew. Shkreli claims he's not hurting people, and that if anyone is to suffer from the price hikes, it's greedy insurance companies. But critics say that bilking those companies, as greedy as they may be, amounts to a cost spread out across taxpayers and raises premiums. When you do that, does that cause health care premiums to increase? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, so the U.S. drug industry is a $500 billion industry. And um, one drug, even the biggest drug in the world, um, can't can't influence um, healthcare premiums. It's too big. It's in fact, drugs are only a portion of healthcare in general. So doctors are, are doctors and hospitals are actually bigger than drug costs. So drug costs are about twenty percent of of all healthcare costs, and eighty percent is hospitals and, and physicians and things like that. Um, and drugs really take it on the chin <laughs> as as the major culprit. And no one sort of complains about hospitals or doctors. Raising one of the smallest drugs in the world, um, say, you know, our drug was public information, it was a $5 million drug. Even if that went up 20-fold, I could tell you it hasn't, um, you know, it's $100 million, which on a $500 billion number, it's basically meaningless. Um, so to me, it's like, it's a little, you know, I mean, my, I have a big mouth, and, and that's kind of, um, the reason a lot of this stuff has happened. That was a good move um, for once. And, um, but you know, there are more expensive drugs. There are bigger drug price increases. I'm not the, you know, and I'm not saying that like, there's a slippery slope of saying like, well, I'm not the worst child abuser. I'm not the worst you know, domestic violence person. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, you know, because uh, I don't think that'd be a, an appropriate argument. I defend what we've done. And I think it's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, like if you want to think it's a bad thing, then you know you can look at other companies. And in fact, the last thing I'll say is about sixty to seventy percent of our patients actually do get it for free. And you can imagine if you extend this kind of offer out to people, they'll take advantage of it, and they do. Um, you know, it's hard to run a business like that. Shkreli has touted that people who can't afford Daraprim can contact him and get it for free. 
But physicians and hospital systems managers across the country have reported that they can't afford to stock the drug, which causes shortages in emergency situations. I'm sure you know that your company, among others, uh, is part of this investigation in the Senate Committee on Aging. And there have been you know, people that are representing hospital systems testifying and saying that you know, there have been shortages at their hospitals in emergency situations, and they can't afford to stock the drug. Uh, beyond just individuals you know, being able to appeal to you personally for free, uh, how do you respond to that kind of a, an issue? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky. So before the price increase, most hospitals had a bottle lying around and they were able to, um, I feel like it's getting hot in here. Um, the, uh, the, uh, they had a bottle and, and they, um, you know, they're, they're sort of, because this drug is so rarely used, there's 5,000 hospitals in the US, and there's only a few thousand people that get this illness to begin with. So most hospitals will actually never see anyone with this illness. And so if you have to hold a bottle just in case, um, and now the price of that bottle is just skyrocketed, I would complain too. And we got all these complaints, and we decided to say, why don't we make you a tiny bottle that is cheaper, we'll lower the price just for you, and, and that seems to have solved the situation as far as I can tell. If you can't afford my medicine, you know where to find me. I'll be online, I'll be on Twitter. There's a way to easily send me a message that says, you know, I can't get this drug, the copay's too high, help me out, Martin. You know, I, I, will, I will race, I will run to help you. Um, I've got nothing better to do. Mm. Yeah, you've talked about how your, your company plans in spending a lot more than the average drug company on research and development. Can you talk about Specifically, you know, what percentage you plan on on using uh, toward research and development versus other companies? Yeah, I mean, I love R and D. Um, we spend about um, sixty percent of our revenue on R and D. The average drug company spends fifteen. So for us, it's it's we put all of our extra income into R and D. We don't pay dividends. We don't do anything with our cash and spend it on research. And I'm happy. You know, I don't care. You know, for Daraprim to cost more money. Fine, you know, if that's the price I have to pay to, to, to find a new medicine for a dying kid, I'll raise it even more. You know, what do I care? You know, uh, Microsoft is gonna lose money, Walmart's gonna lose money. You know, why are we crying about this? You know, it's not like there's, there's people that are actually gonna suffer from this. It's big, fat, you know, uh, corporations that pay healthcare bills in the United States. But the reality is Daraprim's dangerous for you. If you took Daraprim right now, you'd get very sick. And I don't see why that needs to be the case. I think you should be able to take a drug that doesn't hurt you. Um, that's not too much to ask. And while we're making all this money, whose responsibility is? It's ours. And the people who invented Daraprim 80 years ago didn't think about that. And the companies, shame on them, who owned it between 1940 and last year when we bought it, they didn't care either to improve it. So we're the first company that said, you know what, let's look, take an honest look at this medicine. It kind of sucks. And again, we're taking a big gamble. Like We have no idea if our second generation drug will work. The escalating price of drugs in the US has become a focus in the 2016 presidential race. The consolidation and lack of competition within the American pharmaceutical business has basically allowed companies to charge whatever they want. In most of Europe, where public health care is a norm, it's governments that determine what drugs to cover and at what price. You know, the United States is one of the few countries that our only country is that doesn't set drug prices. Um, why do you think that's a good thing? Well, I'm not sure it's a good thing, right? I mean, I, I think it, countries that set drug prices, um, that's sort of a, an imaginary concept. No country can set a drug price. Drug companies set drug prices. What kind of is misunderstood and what people don't understand is they're companies, they have owners, and their owners demand that they extract as much profit as possible. And that's the rule of law today. If you don't like that, you know, I don't know what to tell you. That's the way th the world works. Whose turn is it? It's mine or yours? You know, your clock went down, but I moved my king here. Oh, OK. Um, you're in check, so this whole game is, is effed. But um, <laughs> you know, whatever. So yeah, maybe we call it a, call it a game. I'll, I'm happy to concede that you won, although, I mean, I am in check, so I guess that's fine. Good game, man. Good game. Yeah, cool. Shkreli's Wu-Tang Clan album set him back $2 million, although you wouldn't guess it. It sits casually in an embossed case in his living room, the only place that it's ever been spun. They call it the Shaolin School. The two CDs are a sc each schools. 
and uh, no one's heard that before, um, but one is the Shaolin School and one is the Allah School. I think like personally, like I see the Jizza and me as like, <laughs> sounds silly. Um, like I see him in me and vice versa, I hope vice versa. Um, he's like sort of the scientist rapper type guy. Are people ever going to be able to hear this album? <laughs> Other than right now, um, <laughs> I think um, it depends. You know, it depends on, on the world. You know, I think that I could see myself in a place where I break it. You know, and I've seriously considered that. Um, or just snap it in half and you know, bury the remains of it so no one tries to reconstruct it. And then I've seen a world where I give it away for free. And I've seen a world where um, I charge for it or something like that or you know and if and if, if people want to hear it I'll put it out if people don't want to hear it and they don't appreciate the Wu-Tang for what I think it is that's fine too so I don't know everything's sort of open open-ended I just bought it a few months ago and I was arrested a month ago so my life's sort of all over the place um, who knows maybe the feds will own it uh, soon but um, you know um, I have a contingency plan if that happens. <laughs>